It's mid-March, 1923, in Gray Horse, Oklahoma. Molly Burkhardt steps into a bedroom, carrying a small leather suitcase. As she closes the door, she looks over at her baby daughter, Anna, who's asleep in a wooden crib. Molly approaches Anna, filled with an intense feeling of love and tenderness. Her daughter has dark hair and high cheekbones, just like Molly's sister, Anna, who she was named after. When the little girl's asleep, there's nothing more innocent or sweet in the entire world. Molly's sure of it. She can't bear to think that somebody might want to hurt an infant. But after everything that's happened recently, she knows she has to prepare for the worst-case scenario. And that means packing up a suitcase and sending her baby daughter away from home. Molly sets down the leather suitcase and opens her drawer. She grabs colorful little one-pieces, knit sweaters, and a teddy bear. She opens another drawer when she hears footsteps coming up the stairs. The door opens and Molly looks up as her husband, Ernest, enters the room. Molly, just stop. We don't have to do this. Yes, we do, Ernest, and you know it. Honey, she's just a baby. She's going to be fine. We don't have to put her in hiding like this. No one's coming for her. Ernest, you think I really want to do this? I don't know. You tell me. Molly sets down a pair of socks and looks over at her baby. Listen to me. I am not doing this because I want to. I am sending away my baby, my baby girl, because I have to. But you don't have to. Ernest, two years ago, my sister, Anna, she was killed, left in a ditch. And then out of nowhere, my mother, she got sick and just died. She'd been healthy. And it was the same thing that happened to my sister, Minnie. A bitter rage seizes Molly as a tear comes creeping down her cheek. Ernest reaches out to grab a hold of her, but Molly turns away. Ernest, you can't even imagine what I'm feeling. About Rita? Yeah. That night when I saw the explosion and all of that fire, I thought it couldn't be. And then we went over and I... Molly wipes away a tear as the memories come flooding back. Just bricks and burnt wood. The smoke everywhere. And then they showed me her body. She was just gone. Molly, honey. And then they figured out it was a bomb? Someone killed my sister with a bomb? I'm... I'm so sorry, Molly. Ernest, I have lost everyone. My sisters, my mother. I am the only one left. But you got me and our baby girl. That's what I'm saying. Don't let her go. Molly shakes her head. She opens a drawer and grabs a blanket and stuffs it into the suitcase. You don't get it. Someone is coming after my family. I don't know why they're trying to kill us off, but I am not going to let them touch my little girl. We have to get her somewhere safe. Suddenly, there's a knock on the front door. I can't, Ernest. Whoever it is, just let it go. I'll take care of it. Just let me see who it is. Just ignore it. They'll come back later. Before Molly can stop him, Ernest walks out and answers the door. A minute later, he returns to the bedroom with his uncle, William Hale. Hale might be the most powerful man in Osage County. He stood with Molly when the autopsy revealed that her sister Anna had been murdered. He vowed then to help Molly get justice for the crime. But standing in the bedroom, Hale removes his hat and says he has some sad news. The explosion last week didn't just kill Molly's sister, Rita. Rita's husband, Bill Smith, also just died at the hospital. Molly begins sobbing, her body trembling. Bill Smith wasn't just her brother-in-law. He was her confidant and went looking for answers about Anna's murder when the authorities were doing nothing. The two had grown to be friends, but now Bill is also gone. And Molly can't help but think that this was some kind of assassination. Bill was looking for answers. He must have been getting close. Why else would someone go after him? With a grimace on his face, William Hale promises once again to help Molly. He says he won't rest until he finds whoever planted this bomb. It may take time, but they'll get justice. Molly wipes away a tear. She prays that Hale is right, that they'll find whoever it is who's killing off her family as well as other members of the Osage Nation. But she knows she can't wait. If someone is killing off her family, her little girl could be next. As painful as it may be, 
She needs to finish packing this suitcase and send her baby far away from home, somewhere where she'll be safe. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. In the early 1900s, vast oil reserves were found in northern Oklahoma on land belonging to the Osage tribe. In a single generation, the tribe's members went from abject poverty to some of the wealthiest people in the world. But that wealth came with a price. With the belief that American Indians couldn't be trusted with money, the federal government assigned each Osage tribe member a white financial guardian. These guardians had complete control over Osage finances, and all too often, they stole from their wards. The Osage also faced unspeakable violence. In the 1920s, at least 24 Osage tribe members were murdered or died for mysterious causes. That included Anna Brown, an Osage woman who was murdered and whose sister Molly went looking for the truth. Eventually, federal law enforcement got involved under the Bureau of Investigation, the agency that would later become the FBI. Agents arrived in Oklahoma and worked to understand who was behind all the deaths. But the deeper they got into the case, the more they discovered a twisted and heartbreaking truth. To help tell the story of the Osage murders, we have enlisted actor Rainbow Dickerson to voice the characters you'll hear throughout our series. This is Episode 2, Who's Next? It's June 1925 in Washington, D.C., Tom White takes off his suede cowboy hat as he enters the office for the federal government's Bureau of Investigation. White weaves between desks, his cowboy boots clicking on the ground. As he surveys the office, he notices that everyone here looks like an accountant. They all have dark suits and ties, all busy tapping away at typewriters. Gives White a bad taste in his mouth. Technically, these are his fellow agents at the Bureau of Investigation, but they seem like they're from another universe. White can't believe how far he strayed from his old life. Years ago, he was a Texas Ranger and spent his days riding a horse, tracking bank robbers and cattle thieves. He loved the solitude, but eventually the life did get a bit lonely. And when he finally settled down and got married, his wife insisted that he do something less dangerous. That's how Tom White ended up in Houston, spending his days at a desk pushing paper. It's a boring life and a boring job and it's become abundantly clear he needs to make some changes. So that's what he's going to do in just a few minutes. White was summoned to Washington to take on a new assignment, but he's going to insist that he be allowed to run the case his way. And if the Bureau won't allow it, he may just quit right there on the spot. White stops in front of a wooden door and knocks. A voice tells him to come in, and when he enters, White finds himself face-to-face with the Bureau's director, J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover stares at White, tells him to take a seat. Over the years, White has seen his fair share of tough people, but something about Hoover is different. He's full of nervous intensity and looks like the kind of guy who's never made a joke in his life. White is about to start speaking, but Hoover cuts him off, reminding White that two dozen members of the Osage tribe have died mysteriously out in Oklahoma. It appears to be a slaughter. The Bureau has already led an investigation, but it turned out to be a disaster one that led to a policeman's death. Altogether, that first investigation made the Bureau look incompetent. Hoover pauses and asks if White understands the implications. White nods. With the botch investigation, the Bureau now has blood on its hands. Hoover's eyes narrow and his voice grows gravelly. He explains that people in Washington are calling for his head. So the only way to fix things is to start over and actually solve the case. He wants White to take on the job. White takes a breath and looks away. He knows that when you're face-to-face with your boss, you're supposed to say yes to any kind of request, then move on with the job. But White is tired of working in an office. He needs something more. And so he tells Hoover that, sure, he'll take the case, but on one condition. Hoover's face grows red. 
He reminds White that he's the director. He's the one who sets the conditions, not White. White nods, but presses forward and tells Hoover that he has only the one demand and he's ready to walk away from the job if the Bureau is inflexible. He wants to do real work, the kind of work that gets him out from behind a desk, out into the streets with real people. Hoover looks like he's about to explode in a fit of rage. White starts to feel a terrible regret. He may have just ended his career. But Hoover then exhales and nods. All right, then, he says, that's the plan. White worked in Texas, so he knows the West, and that makes him a good man for the job. He'll head out to Oklahoma and lead the team of agents working the case out in the field. White hesitates for a moment. This is an exciting offer, but he's read about the case. If he takes the job, he'll be a marked man the second he steps foot in Oklahoma. One investigator has ended up dead already. And if that happens to him, he'd leave his wife without a husband and his child without a father. As if Hoover is reading his mind, he says it's true, it's dangerous work, but that's why White is the right man for the job. All those agents out there with their degrees from Harvard, they couldn't handle this. But a Texas Ranger like Tom White, Hoover knows that he's tough enough and smart enough to finish the job. White cracks a smile. That's all he needed to hear. So he popped his cowboy hat back on his head and tells Hoover that they have a deal. A few weeks later, the clock strikes midnight on the old bank building in Fairfax, Oklahoma. Inside a dusty old office, Tom White looks over a half dozen men, all sitting around a table. A couple look like old cattlemen. One of them looks like an insurance salesman. And sitting in the center of the group is a member of the Ute tribe, who could pass as an Osage medicine man. All these men appear to be locals, and that makes Tom White grin, because the truth is they're all undercover agents. They're members of his team, and together they're going to solve the murders and deaths that have plagued this community. As White sits down with the men, he can't help but feel like he struck gold. Only months ago, he had what felt like a dead-end job in a dead-end office. But now he's organizing a team of undercover agents out in the field, developing a plan to protect a community. Doesn't get better than this. White locks eyes with the men and reminds them of the mission. Someone or some group is killing members of the Osage Nation. It's become a slaughter, and it has to be stopped. They're going to focus on three cases. The murder of Anna Brown, whose body was found in a gorge. The bombing that killed Rita and Bill Smith. And the murder of Henry Roan, who was shot in his car. White begins outlining his vision for the case, reminding the agents to stay away from local law enforcement. But as he talks, one of the agents interrupts him and says that that's a bad idea. Local law enforcement officials are usually key sources. White shakes his head, though, and remains firm. He reminds the team that in these parts, lawmen can't be trusted. It's members of the community that they need to reach out to. Another agent chimes in, saying that the Bureau has already spent thousands of hours looking into the murders and come up empty-handed. White doesn't allow himself to get frustrated. He stays calm and tells the group that they're not up against a dead end. He's already spoken with Molly Burkhart, the sister of Anna Brown. Molly had found a few solid leads on her own, and after tonight, someone should look into them. But, White says, even though there's already a mountain of reports, some key files are missing. One example is the coroner's report from Anna Brown's death. It disappeared and may have been stolen. If they learn who took the report, they may be able to figure out who was responsible for the murder. At the mention of these new leads, the agents begin talking excitedly, and White grins. They may have been hesitant at first, but he can see that he's won them over. White ends the meeting, instructing the agents to explore all avenues. No clue is too small. The agents rise and file out into the night. After they're gone, White collapses into a chair. All at once, he realizes he's exhausted. He's been going non-stop since his meeting in Washington. What he needs is a good night's sleep. But White knows he isn't going to get one anytime soon. Tomorrow morning, he needs to get up early. Time to speak with the last person who ever saw Anna Brown. The next morning, Tom White steps into the back office of a funeral parlor in Fairfax, Oklahoma. As he glances around, he spots jars of fluid and gleaming surgical tools. The air reeks of chemicals. And sitting behind a curved wooden desk is a thin, balding man with the gloomy look of an undertaker. 
White approaches the man who's hovering over a mixture of embalming fluids. Morning, friend. Quite a business you've got going here. Mm, Not sure I could do the work myself. The man lays down a bottle. I know you. (laughs) Not yet. I'm just hoping to get some information. Look, you got someone who died? Go to the office. They'll take care of you. I only do the work. Oh, I know that. Thing is, I'm here to talk to you. The man who worked on Anna Brown. The undertaker stiffens and looks away. Well, looks like I got the right guy. I I don't know Anna Brown. Oh, I think you do. I think everyone in town knows about Anna. Well, not me. I just work on bodies. I finish one, and then I go on to the next one. White puts on a genial smile and sits down on the tabletop right next to the undertaker. Look, buddy, just work with me here. Uh, Otherwise, and I really don't want to have to do this, I could have you arrested. Obstruction of justice. Take a look. White reaches into his jacket and pulls out a badge. The undertaker freezes and drops his head. Look, mister, don't make me do this. Do what? Talk. Come on, now. You know what they're doing to people who start yapping their mouths. Who are they? I I don't know. I just... I don't want to talk. Look, just give me something. I'm not going to talk. I'm not like the locals here. But I do carry a badge. Okay. Fine. The undertaker walks over to a metal safe and spins the dial. Then he pulls open the door and reaches in to grab something. When he turns back, he's holding a human skull. The sight of it shocks Tom White. Whose skull is that? Who do you think? Is that Anna Brown's skull? Why do you have that? Because, look. The undertaker slowly turns around the skull. White notices a small bullet hole in the back, but nothing in the front. No exit wound? No, there ain't one. So she's shot in the back of the head but no hole in the front, which means the bullet must have got lodged in the skull. There's no bullet. Bullets don't just disappear. That's what doesn't smell right. White's eyes narrow. He's getting somewhere. Remind me, who was the doctor, the one that did the autopsy? Well, there were two. The Shown brothers said they couldn't find the bullet. So you're saying... What? These doctors, the Shown brothers, they just took the bullet? I don't know, and that's all I'm going to say. Look, I got to get back to work. But listen, you you keep your promise. Don't mention my name to anyone, you understand? Of course, I give you my word. A minute later, Tom White steps back into the dusty street, his mind racing. He needs to find that missing bullet. But even more important than the bullet itself, he needs to figure out why it went missing. White grabs a notebook and pen from his pocket. He has a long list of people he needs to interview. But at the top of the list, he's going to add a pair of names he needs to track down right away. The Shown Brothers. It's evening in mid-September 1925. Outside Fairfax, Oklahoma, a black Model T Ford rumbles down a two-lane highway. Behind the wheel is one of Tom White's agents, a man who's been posing as an insurance salesman. It's been a long day of work, and the agent is ready to find his way to a couch and kick up his heels. It's been an exhausting few months. In his undercover role, the agent is supposed to talk his way into people's homes and fish around for details about their lives. The goal is to map out the web of personal connections in the community. It's a clever and sophisticated method because if you understand how a community works, get to know people's friends and people's enemies, then you can begin to understand a murder, why someone would want someone else dead, and why other people would help protect a secret. But it's grueling work, and most people aren't willing to talk to a stranger. But the agent has to keep pushing forward. Case is nearing a breakthrough. Recently, Tom White met with the Shown brothers, the two doctors who performed the autopsy on Anna Brown. He was looking for information about the bullet that killed her and then went missing. But when White asked about it, the two doctors claimed ignorance. It was a frustrating setback, but after Tom White pressed one of the brothers, he opened up about another victim, a man named Bill Smith. The doctor said that he spoke with Smith as he lay dying in the hospital after his house was bombed. He was writhing in pain 
wondering who could have done it. Smith told the doctor that he had only two enemies, Ernest Burkhart and William Hale. It sounded like an implication that the men were behind the bombing. But the admission didn't make a lot of sense. Ernest Burkhart was Bill Smith's in-law. They had no reason to hate each other. And William Hale is a generous philanthropist and a wealthy rancher. He was even the pallbearer at the funeral of Henry Roan, another one of the murder victims. It seems impossible that Hale had anything to do with the killing. But as the agents dug deeper, they grew more suspicious. They learned that Hale had endorsed a number of local politicians who'd gone on to win. He appears to be the most powerful man in town, someone who can pull strings. And with all their suspicions that local corruption is somehow at the center of these murders, the investigation turned to Hale. Their suspicions only grew stronger when two of the agents stopped by Hale's ranch for a chat. He was rude, demanding they get off his land. As they left, the agents grew only more convinced. They needed to dig up whatever they could find about William Hale. Out on the highway, the agent glances at the dashboard and notices he's low on gas. He pulls into a station where a young female attendant approaches the car. She's a redhead in blue jeans, and she leans down to the agent's window. Hey, sport. What's it going to be? Just fill her up. You got it. The attendant grabs a nozzle and starts pumping gas. As the tank fills up, the agent leans out the window. Well, miss, sure is late. Yeah, no kidding. But truth is, I don't mind. I just bought a house, so gotta make the money. Hey, new house. Well, congratulations. I hope you got a good deal. Well, mister, you bet I did. I bought it from William Hale. Nice guy. Even took off a thousand dollars. At the mention of Hale's name, the agent's ears perk up. Hale, huh? Oh boy, I'd love to do business with him. Well, what's your line of work, mister? I'm in the insurance business. <laughs> well, you're an insurance man. I'd steer far, far clear of William Hale. Why is that? The young woman suddenly tenses up. Oh, it's nothing. I shouldn't say anything. Come on now, miss. I'm tired from a long day. I could use a good story. It's just... I don't want to get anyone in trouble. Look, I promise, whatever gossip you've got, I won't tell a single soul. The attendant looks over her shoulders, then leans into the car. Well, look, story is, William Hale, he takes out this big insurance policy. It's for his ranch, which, well, you know, it's a huge property. So a few years go by, then one day there's a fire on the property, and William Hale walks away with $30,000. Whoo! That's a real haul. Yeah, no kidding. But I don't get it. Fires happen. I don't see what's special. What's special is that the fire wasn't... Mm, natural? Hale paid his workers to start it, including my boyfriend. Well, ex-boyfriend, which is why I don't mind spreading this particular gossip. But look, you didn't hear it from me. My lips are zipped shut. A minute later, the attendant takes the gas nozzle out of the car, and the agent hands her a $5 bill. Without waiting for change, he pulls back on the highway. In the grand scheme of crime, arson and insurance fraud is fairly minor, and who knows if the woman's story will check out. But this particular crime involves William Hale, the man now at the center of their investigation. Two weeks later, Tom White sits by a phone, waiting impatiently for a call. He's inside his office in Fairfax, Oklahoma, and for hours he's been waiting to hear from a forensics lab in Washington. They've been analyzing a piece of evidence that could blow open this whole case. But so far he's heard nothing, and with every passing minute he worries the lab won't have any good news. White knows he can't sit around and fret. So he rises and returns to a corkboard on the wall, covered with a web of photos. Taken together, these photos represent a map of the most important personal connections in the community, people's friendships and family ties, their business partners, and their enemies. It's a detailed portrait of Fairfax, Oklahoma, but White is only focused on two photos, one of William Hale, the White rancher, and another of Henry Roan, the Osage man who was shot dead in his car. The two photos are connected because reportedly the two were best friends. But White and his agents have been looking closer at William Hale ever since they discovered that Hale may have been involved in insurance fraud, setting a blaze to his own ranch. 
The picture only grew more complicated when White discovered something that smelled like more insurance fraud. Apparently, a $25,000 life insurance policy was taken out on Henry Roan right before he was murdered. The beneficiary of that policy was William Hale. White tracked down the salesman who issued the policy. The man explained that he'd never met Roan, and it was unusual when Hale approached him looking to buy the policy. Normally, under state law, only family members can benefit from life insurance. Hale had asked the salesman if there were any exceptions, allowing non-family to be paid the benefit. The agent told him there was only one exception. It involves debt. If someone owes money to someone else, then yes, a life insurance policy can cover that debt. Tom White's interest was piqued. The salesman continued the story, saying that a few weeks later, Hale returned to the office and told the salesman that Roan was, in fact, in debt to him. The matter had just slipped his mind. Then he showed the insurance salesman a typewritten creditor's note showing that Roan owed him $25,000. The salesman ultimately processed the paperwork and Hale got the life insurance policy on Henry Roan. And then, of course, it was unfortunate news when Roan was found dead. When the salesman finished his story, Tom White's eyes lit up. He asked to see the creditor's note and then sent it off to the crime lab for analysis. He's not sure what they might find, but it's possible that buried inside this life insurance policy was a scheme to profit off of murder. White starts pacing his office when finally the telephone rings. He grabs the receiver and sure enough, it's someone from the crime lab who says they have remarkable news. They used microscopes and close-up photography and they were able to prove definitively that the creditor's note was tampered with. Someone scraped ink off the paper's surface and then added new information. White's hands tremble as he thanks the lab technician and hangs up. If he had any doubt before, there's now no question that William Hale forged the note, then used it to take out an illegal life insurance policy covering his supposed friend Henry Roan, a friend who was then murdered, resulting in a $25,000 payoff to William Hale. White returns to the court board and stares at the photos of William Hale and Henry Roan. He knows that this isn't smoking gun evidence, but they're close. He can feel it, and soon the truth is bound to emerge. It's early October 1925 in Gray Horse, Oklahoma. In her mansion outside town, Molly Burkhart lies propped up in bed. Once again, she feels incapacitated, with a headache and a stabbing pain in her stomach. And once again, she's getting a visit from James Shown, a doctor with a thick waxed mustache. Shaun leans over and Molly feels a prick as he injects her with another dose of insulin. Shaun then reaches into his bag and pulls out a glass vial. He explains that it's a tincture of vitamin B mixed with alcohol. Molly should take several drops under her tongue every night. Molly groans. Her nightstand is already full of tinctures and pills. She wants to be taking less, not more. Dr. Shaun is about to respond, but Molly's husband Ernest steps forward. He reminds Molly that Shaun is the one with medical training. He knows best. Molly needs to follow orders. Molly is tired and frustrated. She's been taking medicine for months, but hasn't gotten any better. She wants to know when all of this is going to change. But the two men agree. Bodies take time to heal. For now, Molly needs to keep following Shaun's directions and take her medicine every day. It's no use fighting. Molly knows they'll just keep arguing. So she nods her head and tells the two men that they're right. She'll do as she's told. Ernest and the doctor look pleased, and a minute later, they leave the bedroom. As they leave, a servant enters the bedroom, holding a package wrapped in paper. She hands it to Molly, then walks out. Molly unwraps the package and finds a prayer book from her priest, along with a note saying that the book is a gift. Now Molly won't feel left out when she can't attend Mass. Molly smiles as she rubs her hand over the cover of the prayer book. She hasn't gone to church in months. She has been well enough. But her priest is a kind man, and now God can hear her prayers even when she's lying in bed. But Molly also wonders what her priest thinks of a letter that she mailed him last month. She told him that she felt all alone and couldn't understand why she kept getting more and more sick. She said she was afraid that someone was poisoning her. The priest's note didn't acknowledge that letter, and now Molly feels embarrassed. He must think she's crazy. She sighs and begins paging through the book. But halfway through, a small bookmark flutters out from the pages. 
Molly picks it up and sees it's another handwritten message from her priest. But this time, the message has a very different tone. It warns her, do not drink liquor of any kind. Molly's mind starts racing. The priest must have gotten her note. He must believe her. He must think she is being poisoned. But there's a problem. Molly doesn't drink much liquor. She shakes her head, unsure what to make of this. When suddenly, in a burst of recognition, her eyes dart over to her nightstand. She may not drink liquor, but she does use these tinctures. And they contain alcohol. And for weeks, she's been insisting that she feels worse after taking them. It never occurred to her that they might be the poison. Suddenly, Molly remembers her mother complaining about the bitter taste of her own medicine. Shortly after, she died. Molly begins to panic. She doesn't know who's telling the truth and why someone would want her dead. She does know one thing. No one can see this message from her priest. So she tucks it away under her mattress. Molly then rises, grabs the new tincture, and heads to the bathroom. She dumps the liquid out and fills the vial with water. If someone is trying to kill her, she's not going to make it easy. It's October 1925 at the McAllister State Penitentiary in eastern Oklahoma. Tom White sits waiting in a small visitation room at the state prison. He's flipping through a magazine, trying to pass the time. But he can't concentrate, not with a meeting he's about to have. It could change the course of his investigation and potentially lead to an arrest. According to the warden, one of the inmates has been talking about the bombing that killed Rita and Bill Smith and saying he knows who did it. White hates relying on the testimony of prisoners. They're notoriously unreliable. But the pressure from Washington is getting more intense, and at this point... White will do anything to solve this case. The door opens and a guard enters with Bert Lawson, a short inmate whose wrists and ankles are shackled. Mr. Lawson, thank you for meeting with me. Yeah, well, it's no favor. You want to talk? You're going to have to do something about my sentence. I want to get out of here. Of course, I understand, and we can discuss that. But first, I need to hear your story. The warden says you know something about the bombing. Mm Mm-mm, I don't think so, sir. You're a lawman. Scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Mr. Lawson, I can't make any promises. Well, seems we've got an impasse. With that, Lawson motions to the guard. Door slides back open and Lawson exits the visitation room. Wait, Mr. Lawson. I need promises. Mr. Lawson. Damn it. White's stuck. He can't promise any kind of reduction in a sentence that came from a state court. It's out of his jurisdiction. But he needs whatever leads he can get. And with people dying, he knows he might have to bend the truth. Fine, Mr. Lawson. Please come back. Listen, I know the DA. He's the final word, but he'll do what I say. That's the best I can offer. Lawson stops, then turns around with a grin on his face. Well, guess what? We got a deal. So what do you want to know? Start with Bill and Rita Smith. A few years ago, their house was bombed. They both died. Good riddance. So you knew them. Didn't know Rita. But Bill, that there's a rotten man. How do you know Bill? Well, Bill, a few years back, he hired me as a ranch hand. Good job till I found out what old Billy Bill was up to. Which was what? He was sleeping with my wife. Mm. I am sorry to hear that. But it sounds like that was a long time ago. What's that got to do with the bombing? Not much, till William Hale got involved. White feels his pulse quicken. And how did William Hale get involved? (laughs) In a big way, sir. A big way. One day, Hale, he tells me, Bert Lawson, I'll pay you $5,000, and you can get back at Bill Smith. All you gotta do is blow up the bastard's house. Mr. Lawson... I'm sorry, but your story doesn't add up. I've seen your records. You were already in jail at the time. How could you possibly help with a bombing? Lord, I'm getting to that. Yeah, I was in jail. But one night, see? My cell door opens, and the deputy, he takes me outside. And there he is, William Hale, just waiting in a car. 
Well, first he drives me over to some building in Fairfax. We meet up with Ernest Burkhart. Wait, stop. Ernest Burkhart, William Hale's nephew. The man who's married to Molly Burkhart. That's the one. Okay, go on. Well, Ernest, he brings out a little wooden crate. It's got this fuse sticking out the top. They drop me off a few blocks from Smith's house. I pick the lock, sneak into the cellar, put down the crate, light the fuse. And then it went off. Oh, yeah. Boom. (laughs) A big one. I was already running for my life, and Hale, he drove me right on back here. Why takes a second to absorb this? Mr. Lawson, maybe I'm slow, but why would William Hale want to kill Bill and Rita Smith? Yeah, you are slow. So what am I missing? What you're missing is oil. And money. Lots of both. Rita and Bill Smith were sitting on oil. And see, the way it works around here is if you got oil rights when you die, those rights go on to your family. But William Hale and the Smiths aren't immediate family. He couldn't get any of their money. They're not directly related. But guess what? Rita Smith is related to Molly Burkhart. Sisters. And Molly's husband is... Go on. Fill it in. Molly's husband is Ernest Burkhart. And Ernest's uncle is William Hale. My God. If Bill and Rita died, Molly would inherit her sister's oil rights. In fact, Molly has already inherited all the oil rights from her dead family members. Her sister, Anna, her mother, all that money, it's flowing like a river and leading right to Molly. Which adds up to... All that money, all those oil rights now belong to Molly. Her husband, Ernest, is her financial guardian. He controls the money, and he and his uncle, William Hale, are very close. Well... Not so slow after all, are you? White feels like he's suffering from vertigo. This could be the truth, the confession that puts an end to all the murders and mysterious deaths. At the same time, it could all be a big lie. Lawson wants desperately to get out of prison, and there's no reason he wouldn't lie if it helped his own cause. White knows he has to be careful. He can't stake the entire case on this confession. But still, he's giddy. If Lawson is telling the truth, then their investigation is about to enter its final stages. A few days later, Tom White stalks through Prairie, a rifle in his hands. He scans the horizon for movement, but all he sees is dry grass and bushes swaying in the breeze. White continues gazing across the prairie land when suddenly he hears a rustling. He drops down, and raising the rifle sight up to his eye, he waits. There's another rustling. White lays his finger over the trigger. And when the shape finally emerges from behind a tree, he fires. But it's too late. The white-tailed buck leaps off into the tall grass and is not seen again. White curses and shoulders the rifle. It's no surprise his shot is off. He's distracted. It's why he came out here in the first place. He wanted to do a little hunting, clear his head, get some perspective on the case, maybe get an insight he hadn't thought of before. It's been a rough few days. White thought the case was coming to a close once he spoke with Bert Lawson, the prison inmate. But quickly and predictably, the confession fell apart. All evidence suggests that William Hale was in Fort Worth, Texas the night that Bill and Rita Smith were killed in a bombing. He couldn't have driven Lawson to the Smith's house to commit the crime. White has also looked more into Ernest Burkhart, and by all accounts, he's a good husband, not the kind of man who would hurt his family members all of which has left White unsure what to believe and what to do next. White turns back to the main road when he spots his deputy's black Ford approaching in the distance. White had told the deputy where he'd be in case something came up, and apparently something has. After parking his car on the dirt road, the deputy steps out and hands White a telegram from Washington. White sets down his rifle, and when he begins reading, his mouth goes dry. It gives him a firm instruction. Get Molly Burkhart to a reputable hospital for diagnosis and treatment, free from the interference of her husband. White looks up from the note. He doesn't know exactly what it means or what information the Bureau has dug up in Washington, but he knows this much. 
Molly Burkhart is in fact in danger, and her husband Ernest may really be a threat. White slips the telegram into his pocket and tells his deputy to get Molly to a hospital immediately. He should take several agents with him, too, in case Ernest Burkhart puts up a fight. White then gets into his car and takes off, heading back into town. The inmate Bert Lawson may have spun a tall tale, a desperate measure to try to get out of prison. But White has to admit, even if the specific details were a lie, the motives make sense. One by one, Molly Burkhart's family members have been killed off, leaving each of their oil rights to Molly. She's sitting on a fortune. And if someone could get their hands on all that money, they might be willing to kill for it, even if it meant murdering your own family. From Wondery, this is episode two of three of the Osage Murders from American Scandal. On the next episode, Tom White begins making arrests as his case comes to a close. But local corruption runs deep and threatens to derail a criminal conviction. If you'd like to learn more about the Osage murders, we recommend the books The Killers of the Flower Moon by David Grant and A Pipe for February by Charles H. Redcorn. You can learn more about the Osage Nation by visiting osageculture.com. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Sound design by Derek Behrens. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Sam Keen. Edited by Christina Malsberger. Our senior producer is Gabe Riven. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauerbeckman, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering.